Great. Uh, we'll get started with uh, value iteration algorithms for the three cases we discussed last time. Okay, so this uh, class is going to be notation heavy. So I want to introduce some notations and fix it for the entire class, perhaps the entire course. So S is finite state space. Oh, U is the finite action space. Uh, U of S is allowed set of actions at state S. C I U J cost function. So this remains the same as uh, what we did in the previous class. Uh, we are going to assume that the cost is non-negative always. Uh, and then P I J U is transition probability, state transition probability. So P mu is the matrix of P i j mu i. Okay, so state i, uh, next state is j, mu i is the action that I'm taking and I stack that as a matrix. So this is a matrix in R or maybe 0, 1, S cross S. Okay, it's a stochastic matrix in S cross S dimension. Then I have the space of value functions so V, the set of V from S to R, that's the space of value function. I'm going to endow this space with some norm. This is the same as, by the way, this is the same as R raised to S. And I'm going to endow it with different norms or different metrics depending on the application. Okay, we had, we have two more notations. So T, which maps from V to V, and this is given by T of V of I is min U in U I. Expected value of C I U J plus summation j in s p i j u v j. Oh, there is an alpha here. So alpha is equal to one for total cost and it will be equal to the discount factor in the discounted cost setting. So let me just write it. Alpha equals to one is total cost slash average cost and alpha in zero one would be the discount factor in uh, discounted cost. So these three MDPs were introduced in the previous class, towards the end of the previous class. And this operator is known as Bellman operator.
okay let me define another operator t mu that also acts from v to v Uh, this is mu is a stationary policy, stationary Markov deterministic policy. And this is T mu V i equals to expected value of C i Instead of writing expectation, let me just write the expression. So summation J in S C I mu I J plus alpha V J P I J mu I. Okay, I'm sorry I have to define so many notations, but that's what this class is about. Okay. So this particular expression can be written in a very compact form using a matrix notation. So I'm going to write it in the matrix notation. T mu of V equals to C mu plus P mu into V. Oh, alpha. So C mu is a vector where you average with respect to J. Uh, take mu as the uh, policy, and then you stack for all the states, you stack it as a vector. So this is actually a column vector, and V is also a column vector. P mu, as we mentioned, is a matrix, S cross S matrix, and alpha is the discount factor, which is equal to one in two cases, uh, total cost and average cost, and is less than one in case it's a discounted problem. Okay, any questions about the notation? So Bellman operator is what we use for dynamic programming. So we use it in a backward induction fashion. Um, but now we are studying infinite horizon problem, so the backward induction will go all the way to infinity, or rather minus infinity. No, well, infinity. Uh, because we'll flip the time coefficient, so. Any questions so far? Okay, most of it is something you have seen before. Uh, now, the basic idea of value iteration algorithm is Pick V naught in R S arbitrarily and let V infinity equals to limit K goes to infinity T raised to K V naught. So basically you compute V K plus one equals to T V K which is t raised to k v naught. This is value iteration algorithm, which is true for uh, shortest 
for total cost and average cost, uh, total cost and discounted cost. Okay. For the average cost case, the value iteration algorithm is slightly more sophisticated. Uh, it's called relative value iteration, so I'll talk about it uh, towards the second half of the class. Uh, the first half of the class, we are focusing exclusively on total cost and discounted cost problems, and we are going to understand the convergence behavior of value iteration algorithms. Okay? That's the goal for the next half an hour. Any questions so far? Okay. There are two essential convergence argument in reinforcement learning. Okay? Uh, not in reinforcement learning, in Markov decision problems. Uh, we'll get to reinforcement learning a little later. Uh, one argument is called monotone convergence theorem. So monotone convergence theorem says that if you have a sequence which always increases, so it's an increasing sequence, and it is bounded from above, then it converges. Okay? So let me write it here. Monotone convergence. So AK is a sequence. A0 or A1 is less than or equal to A2 is less than or equal to A3 and so on. And this is all less than or equal to some upper limit A bar. Then this would imply that limit AK, K goes to infinity, exists. So this limit, is, limit exists. Okay? This is known as monotone convergence theorem. And this is also true for vectors. So even if AK were in Rn, and this is the usual order in Rn, so element-wise ordering, then this holds. So let me make that more formal. OK, so A is, so in Rn, An is less than e so A is less than equal to B implies that AI is less than equal to BI for all I in 1 to N. Okay, so A is a stacked vector of AIs, B is a stacked vector of BIs. So we say that A is less than equal to B if AI is less than equal to BI. So this is the usual order. in Rn, and this monotone convergence theorem holds in Rn as well, as long as you take the ordering in this particular fashion. Okay? So this is the one important argument, convergence argument in, uh, in uh, value iteration algorithm. So this is argument number one, or tool number one, and then the tool number two is the contraction mapping argument, which says that f from Rn to Rn is a contraction under some norm. Okay? And then you can apply a contraction mapping theorem to prove the result. So in this case, f would be the operator t. Okay, so we'll show that in fact, let me replace it with T, and let me replace it with S. So T is a contraction under some norm, okay? Those are the two tools we need to use for 
um, proving convergence of the algorithm. Any questions so far? So contraction mapping is something you have seen in uh, the context of gradient descent algorithms and primal dual algorithms in 5759, which I'm, if I recall correctly, almost everyone in the room has taken that class. Um, so now you will see the real power of contraction mapping theorem beyond static optimization. Okay. No questions? All right, so let's talk about the total cost problem. This is known as stochastic shortest path algorithm. Okay, sorry, stochastic shortest path problem, so SSP. So total cost MDP is the same as stochastic shortest path problem. And many of you might have heard of shortest path problem or Dijkstra algorithm. How many of you have heard of Dijkstra algorithm? So many of you. Right, so this is all, so Dijkstra algorithm is a deterministic dynamic programming algorithm. Um, the value iteration is the stochastic version of that deterministic algorithm. So, so all of this is interconnected, okay? So Dijkstra algorithm is the same as iterating Bellman operator on a deterministic problem where there is no expectation and there is no PIJ, okay? So now this is a stochastic version of Dijkstra algorithm, which is what we are going to talk about. And the question is, if you continue applying Dijkstra algorithm over and over again, is it going to converge? Okay? So you can think of it that way, or you can think of it as if you iteratively apply Bellman operator, is this going to converge for the total cost problem? So total cost uh, or stochastic shortest path problem. Okay, total cost MDP. So here, the assumption is assumption one, uh, C is greater than or equal to zero. Assumption two, uh, there exists a proper policy. Assumption three, Let me call it mu bar. So there exists a stationary proper policy. So a proper policy is the one that terminates with probability one. Assumption three is improper policy implies infinite cost for some initial state. So if I pick a, uh, an improper policy, um, I will arrive at infinite cost at least for one initial state. Possibly more initial states. So there are two uh, results in this case, which I want to write down.
So theorem one J star equal to T J star. So this is the fixed point of the, oh, I'm using J star. Let me use V star because I've been using V for value function. So V star equals to T V star for implies there exists a unique Uh, actually, let me – oh, so this is – V star is optimal if and only if V star optimal value if and only if T V star equals to V star. Uh, v star is unique fixed point of T. And T raised to K, V converges to V star for all V in mu is optimal or mu star is optimal if t mu star v star equals to t v star. Okay. So that's theorem one. Theorem two is actually a bit more complicated. So this so let me tell you the proof argument which I'm going to cover perhaps in some time. So the proof argument is monotone convergence theorem. Uh, so the argument is use monotone convergence. Okay. The problem with monotone convergence is that it only gives you the convergence asymptotically in the sense that as k goes to infinity, your limit would exist. The problem with convergence guarantees of this type is that you don't know at k equals to 1000 how close or how far you are from the optimal solution. Right? So we are typically not just interested in knowing whether an algorithm converges because most algorithms converge in infinite time steps and no one has infinite time to run the algorithm, right? You have to graduate at some point of time. You don't want to be stuck doing the homework for this class. So that's the problem with monotone convergence theorem. So we would ideally like to have uh, an algorithm that has a contraction property because it tells you exactly how far you are from the optimal solution at the end of infinite time steps. Uh, sorry, at the end of uh, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 time steps. Okay? 
All right. So when do we have contraction? If all stationary policies are proper, then T is a T from V to V is a contraction under a norm which is parameterized by C. So let's discuss what this C parameter is. We haven't yet defined C because that's going to take some time. But this is what the contraction argument is. Have any of you seen a norm of this type before on Rn? Have you seen it? No? No one? Okay. All right, so how do you define C? That's the next question. So consider So consider MDP prime where C equals to minus 1. So except for the terminal state, of course, in terminal state, cost is 0. Uh, so C at terminal state is, of course, identically equal to 0. So once you reach terminal state, you don't accrue any cost. But outside of terminal state, you have C, the cost is equal to negative 1 for all possible transitions. and Let V hat star be the optimal value function for this MDP prime. Then C equals to minus V hat star. And the contraction coefficient beta is going to be max over i, ci minus 1 over ci. This is the contraction coefficient of t. Okay, so for this problem where all stationary policies are proper, so if I want to go from here to Dublin, no matter what stationary policy I pick, I will always reach Dublin with probability 1 uh, in finite amount of time. Then the value iteration algorithm is a contraction mapping under this particular norm. 
uh, where the parameter C is given by the solution to another MDP, uh, and C is equal to minus V star, and in fact beta, which is the contraction coefficient of this value iteration map T, is given by this expression. And this is always going to be less than one. So once you know that this is the case, then your value iteration algorithm will convert very quickly, exponentially quickly, to the optimal solution. Yes. Is this C equal to minus one to the assumption that C minus so yeah, so so this is for the for this particular theorem to hold. But the fact that with C equals to minus one, you can have an optimal value function that holds independently of that assumption. Okay. So this is merely asking for an existence of a value function. These are all sufficient conditions, right? So it's not uh, the total cost problem. In total cost problem, you can remove all of these assumptions. It's only that the proof is going to be much more laborious. So I'm not going to cover it in the class. But you can refer to Putterman's book, as well as Bertzeker's Dynamic Programming and Optimal Control book. And he has most of the cases uh, written there. Um, and all the proofs as well. So things get quite complicated if you remove any of the assumptions. That's a good question. OK, any questions so far? So now I'm going to prove this particular theorem first because it's, uh, it's an important theorem. So let's look at what v hat is going to satisfy, OK? So v hat of i star is equal to min of u minus 1 plus summation p i j u v hat star j. Okay, this is the Bellman operator. Uh, the cost is negative one, and this is the future expected value we are going to get. And since it's the optimal value function, uh, it will satisfy this equality. So this is one. Second, as I'm, second uh, observation is that v hat of i is always going to be negative. Anyone can think of why this would be negative? Yeah. Because the terminal cost is zero and the... No, this is not the terminal cost. This is the running cost. Yeah, I'm saying because the terminal cost is zero and the oh, running cost, right. cost is only ever or negative. Yes. So we're always either going to be instantaneously at the terminal state or right. some accumulation of cost that is negative. Right. So at every point of time, you are going to accrue a negative cost until you reach the terminal state. So definitely v hat of i is going to be negative. So this implies that this is less than or equal to minus 1 plus summation p i j u v hat star j for every u, so this holds for every u, because this is the minimum, so if I pick any other u, then it's only going to increase or keep it the same value. And I know that this is negative and this is positive, so this is less than or equal to minus one. Okay, so not only this is less than zero, but in fact it is less than equal to minus one, except for when you are at the terminal state. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, I have to make a small correction. So this I cannot be, so this I has to be in the state space S minus the terminal state. Because at terminal state, C is going to be equal to zero and B is also going to be equal to zero. So I want to remove that from the, the set of I's over which you are maximizing it. Okay? So this would imply that C star I is greater than equal to one. Because C is equal to minus V hat star. Oh, there is no star here, so C is minus V, so that is greater than or equal to 1. Now, I'm going to multiply both the sides by negative sign, so I have minus v hat star i is greater than or equal to one plus no one yeah plus summation p i j u minus v hat star j. So this implies that C i minus one is greater than or equal to summation P i j u C j and this is implies that beta C i is greater than or equal to summation j p i j u c j. Okay, so this is the this holds true because of this assumption not assumption, but the way we have defined beta. <clears throat> okay, any questions so far? All of you understood this step? Okay. Let's consider T mu V minus T mu V bar let me evaluate it at state I Okay, so now I want to show that T is a contraction. So before I see, I show T is a contraction, I want to show that T mu is a contraction where mu is a stationary policy. Uh, remembering well that any stationary policy by assumption is proper. So all stationary policies are proper, that's an assumption here. 
So no matter which stationary policy I pick, mu, it's going to be a proper policy. And this is what T mu V minus T mu V bar evaluated at I is given by this particular expression. This is the absolute value, and I'm evaluating it at state I. Now this is less than equal to summation Okay. What should I do now? So remember what the norm here is. So the, in the norm, I have to divide by Xi, right? So let me divide and multiply by Xi. So I'm going to divide here by Cj multiply it by cj and i haven't changed anything right because it's the multiplication and division by the same number okay now this is less than equal to summation of cj piju and this is the C norm of V minus V bar. This summation is over J. Let me write it as S minus T can be viewed as time. I want to write S without the terminal state. Can someone tell me what should I use? What notation should I adopt for without terminal state? S minus tau. Tau is stopping time. I don't want to use tau. Uh, S0, OK? So S0. Let's say S0 without terminal state. So S0, S without terminal state. This is all S0. OK. So S0, so this all summation is over S0, which is the states minus the terminal state. Uh, what do I have here? So this is a constant, okay, V minus V bar uh, norm of it. This, on the other hand, we saw here that summation of Pij multiplied by Cj is less than equal to beta ci, okay? So I'm going to use that expression here. So this is beta ci v minus v bar c. Oh, this is really cool. So I can take ci on this side And I have the following. I have T mu V minus T mu V bar I over C I is less than equal to beta V minus V bar C. Yeah. So the step we're moving from 
the absolute value of bj minus b bar j down to the uh, norm of c. Yeah, this yeah. one. Okay. Uh, uh, is that pulled out uh, over the summation because the, the next step doesn't make sense? And it's, if it's being evaluated over something and we didn't. So, so this is uh, evaluated. So this is vj minus v bar j over cj. Mm -hmm. The way we have defined the norm is it's max over all such i's. Mm -hmm. So, but that, that can be pulled right. out from the sum as right. a constant. But, okay. Yeah. So you can. Yeah, that's that's right. So you can pull it out of the sum, okay. and the summation is only with respect to pij, well, that and that gets out of the summation. Yeah, that's right. OK, so we have this expression. Uh, this side is independent of i. This side is dependent on i. So it certainly is true for max of i. But it only proves that t mu is a contraction with respect to the uh, contraction parameter beta. We want to show that t is a contraction. We want to show that the value, it, the Bellman operator is a contraction. We don't want to show that t mu is a contraction. So what should I do about that? Do, do everyone understands the problem now? So we have shown that T mu is a contraction, but I want to show that T is a contraction. The Bellman operator is a contraction, not Bellman operator evaluated at a specific policy. Okay. Sorry, what? Uh, where are we using the policy, uh, the fact that it's a station, like specific policy? Uh, we haven't used it at all in this case. Well, maybe this u was coming from mu of i. Uh, mu, so this u is mu of i. Yeah. Okay. So now we need to go from here to the contraction of T. So let's do this. So T mu of V is let evaluated at i is less than or equal to t mu of v bar evaluated at i plus beta v minus v bar c. Oh, do I need to put c i also here? I need to put c i. So that is true. Now I'll take minimum on both sides with respect to mu, okay? So by the uh, question number four in the assignment, I think, 4a, in the assignment, if I take minimum over mu on both the sides, I still retain the uh, inequality. So note that this is a constant, so it's not participating in this minimization. This is the only thing that depends on mu, and that participates in the minimization. And this is 4a of assignment, if I remember correctly. OK, and this gives me tv of i is less than or equal to t v bar of i plus beta c i v minus v bar c.
Because remember, in Bellman operator, we always take minimizing, minimization over all possible actions, which in this case is same as minimizing over all possible policies. And that gives me the Bellman operator T. Now, there is no reason to believe that V and V bar has any special status so that the inequality can only hold in this way. Same argument applies. T of V bar i is less than or equal to T of V i plus beta C i V minus V bar C. Uh, CI can change with respect to state, yeah. It's a real number. So infinity, in infinity norm, this is equal to 1. CI is equal to 1 for all i. Okay, so this is a generalization of infinity norm on Rn. <coughs> you can think of it as this way. It's an infinity norm for a squeezed space. You have stressed the space along one direction. You have squeezed it along other direction. And then you are taking the infinity norm of that particular space. Yeah, you had a question. Where did we use the assumption that all stationary forces are proper? In order to get this, uh, uh, so if if policies are not proper, then you may not have a value function for this MDP prime. So this equation may not hold. So the fact that you could terminate, because all policies are proper, you can terminate, and therefore. You will terminate with probability one, and therefore such a value would exist. Okay. So that's a good question. What happens if it is, if there is a non-stationary policy? Sorry. If sorry, what I'm saying is, if there is an improper policy. Why would that be a problem for this MDP? I guess this is the solution may add up to infinity. Yes, so your V hat I. So if you have an improper policy, then it means that uh, remember that C is equal to minus 1. So if you have an improper policy, it means that there is a path so that with positive probability, you will never reach the terminal state which means v hat i star would become minus infinity. And so c i star, uh, oh sorry, c i would become infinity. So that's what you want to avoid. Any other question? OK. So we have this. Uh, so this implies that t v bar or t v i minus t v bar of i over c i is less than or equal to beta v minus v bar c take supremum over or maximum over all i in s naught on this side and you get the contraction argument for the bellman operator t okay That completes the proof. <coughs> OK. The reason why this, this uh, result is, the reason why I wanted to go through the proof of this particular result is because I wanted to show you the power of contraction mapping theorem, and more importantly, what assumptions you need to make and what norm you need to pick in order to make the contraction argument work. Okay? 
We also touched upon quite a few points, a few inequalities that you would normally see in a DP algorithm um, in order to make this whole argument work. So it's just a good review of various arguments and also the fact that the norm is really important when you want to prove that something is a contraction. Okay, it's not obvious. In this case, it's highly non-obvious that it would be a contraction if somebody didn't think about changing the norm according to a very specific fashion. Okay, yeah. Can we say anything about is that the unique norm this works under or is it just a provable norm? So that's a good point. Um, so the book doesn't say this is the only norm. Um, my feeling is if you pick C in a different way, uh, some of these arguments would still work out and you could get a tighter bound for beta. Um, you see what I'm saying? Uh, so beta, okay. Uh, I think this is a problem in, worth investigating. Okay, so but here is my argument. Beta gives you one contraction parameter for this operator T. Potentially, you could change the norm and you can get a tighter bound on beta. Okay? Now the question is, how do you get a different value of beta? Well, you can change the cost function in a very specific fashion. I don't know, that depends on the problem that you're studying. So you could have C equals to minus 0 0.5 for some cases and minus one for the other cases. And then this would correspondingly change to 0 0.5 in some cases and one in some other case. And then you can take max over all i and you could get a much tighter value of beta than what you can potentially get from this argument. But the key here is the choice of your cost function c in the MDP prime in order to compute c. And And I don't think, based on my experience with some of these arguments, I don't think this is a unique norm under which this would be a contraction. You can perhaps play around with C to get a tighter contraction coefficient, which will give you a tighter convergence guarantee. So a tighter convergence guarantee means, in reality, you see that the algorithm converges in 20 iterations. In theory, you show that it converges in 1,000 iterations, so there is a gap. Okay, so how do you close the gap? Well, you have to tighten this contraction coefficient in order to close the gap. And in this case, based on his question, it seems like you can play around with this cost function in order to get a tighter bound. But in theory, once you prove it's a contraction, it's done. You want to close the chapter and move on in life. Uh, you don't want to focus too much attention on tightening some of these bounds. Yeah. Um, no. So it only affects the theoretical convergence guarantee, but it doesn't affect the actual convergence when you implement the algorithm. You see what I'm saying? Because when you are implementing, it's the true Bellman operator. You're not making any approximation. But whenever you come up with the theoretical guarantee, look at how many approximations we have made. Okay, and this is not it. There are approximations all the way, okay? Everywhere you see there is an approximation. And it points out that this beta is likely very loose bound. Okay, so. So in fact, this is a bone of contention. When you write a paper and you say, we have this uh, bound on the contraction or whatever. We have this bound on the performance of the algorithm, but in fact, our algorithm performs much better. Then the reviewer would say, where exactly in the proof have you messed up, right? And then you keep going back and forth with the reviewer trying to argue that, well, this is what I can do. And if you want to tighten the bound, please go ahead and do it yourself. Don't ask me to do it. <laughs> so with those statements of, about the guarantees of convergence, if you could say prove that the beta over all norms was the minimal beta, could you then guarantee something that it won't yes. converge faster than this? Yes, so um, no, not, not only that, you, so in that situation, if you want to prove that this is 
the ultimate bound and there is nothing that is faster than this. You also have to provide a very curated initial condition so that that bound is always met throughout the trajectory. Okay. Okay, and that's a, a much more difficult problem to do, to solve. Okay, any other question? All right, so this is the uh, value iteration algorithm for stochastic shortest path problem. It converges. Let's look at discounted problem. I don't have space on the board. What should I erase? I'll erase that side. So discounted problem is the easiest of all possible MDPs that you can ever think of. Because there are hardly any assumption for discounted problems to have a fixed point. Assumption the cost is bounded. Okay, you don't have infinite cost. So if you assume that your cost is always bounded, so you can have high cost, you can have 1 billion as your cost or 1 trillion as your cost, but it's not infinity. Then T. is contraction with coefficient <coughs> with contraction coefficient alpha, which is the discount factor. Okay, so what you have is TV1, TV2, infinity is less than or equal to alpha V1 minus V2. Okay, I'm going to leave it as an exercise because it's really trivial. In fact, I'll actually give this as a problem in assignment two because this is so trivial exercise to do. <clears throat> okay, so T is a contraction. The Bellman operator is a contraction in discounted MDP, which implies that value iteration algorithm, which means VK plus 1 equals to TVK, it converges to the optimal solution. <clears throat> In fact, VK plus 1 minus V star is less than equal to alpha raised to K V0 minus V star. <clears throat> So you get closer and closer. This is all infinity norm. So you get closer and closer to the optimal solution as you increase the value of k. Okay. So for stochastic shortest path problem, we have a contraction operator. If all stationary policies are optim are proper, uh, in the discounted case, no assumptions. Just C should be bounded. You have a contraction, and the value iteration algorithm converges. Uh, for the 
uh, average cost MDP, things are a bit more complicated. So let's try and understand what happens in average cost case. <coughs> So what happens in average cost MDP? So let's say I have uh, VK plus 1, I define it as TVK, which is min U C expectation C I U J plus summation P i j u v k j j in s. Okay. What is the problem here? Uh, if I'm running this iteration again and again, There is no guarantee that it will. It is, bound, bounded time it is bounded, right? So every time you are adding a cost, there is nothing that is getting subtracted or nothing that is getting contracted, as is the case in uh, uh, the, the discounted problem. So this can continue to grow and, in fact, escape to infinity. Okay? So we somehow need to. <clears throat> we somehow need to make sure that our algorithm does not output a value function that escapes to infinity. How would we do that? Sorry? Divide over k. Oh, OK. So his point is, I am going to perhaps do something like this. So you are then changing your operator at every point of time, because your operator is not just one operator, but operator over some time index that is changing, or iteration index that is changing over time. So that makes it difficult to analyze. Any other thoughts? Yeah. The average cost, cost up until step k is less than k. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have some bound that uh, while we could have a wildly high cost, on average, it's going to decrease and be slightly less than the number of steps we're taking. So we'll have some decay cost up, or some decay expectation. Uh, let's see. OK, I'm not able to counter your argument. <laughs> uh, it might be too strict of, of a sufficient condition, but that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. So what's the other idea I can try? So one idea that I can try is subtract a constant function from this ever-increasing function. OK? So what I could do is. I compute TVK, so VK plus 1 is equal to TVK minus VK at some state S0, uh, sorry, uh, at some state I0. OK? So I evaluate the TVK, I evaluated the Bellman operator at VK. And then I subtract from it VK at some state, some arbitrarily picked state. What does this imply? Let's think of it in terms of a graph. So I have this function 
this is my VK or TVK. And I subtract a constant function from this TVK, what does it do? It just moves it lower, okay? So you get the same shape, but the values are much lower than the original values started with. So this is TVK minus VK I zero. And this is known as relative value iteration. Why relative? Because it's relative to some constant function. So relative value iteration. Yeah. Isn't VK changing with the iteration? So it's not exactly a constant. It's not, it, no. So VK is changing with iteration, uh, but you are just picking one state as a reference state and making sure that at that particular state, the value is equal to zero. Okay, so le let me uh, go over the uh, convergence proof in the next class because this class we don't have time, but I still want to talk a little bit about this uh, value iteration algorithm. Uh, so in this case, you're subtracting a different constant function at every point of time because VK is different across time, okay? Now this value iteration, again, convergence, relative value iteration converges under some conditions, okay? So what is the condition? It requires the underlying Markov decision problem to have some structure. And let me tell you what that structure is. So in the stochastic shortest path problem, this is my state space S. This is my terminal state. Let me call it zero. So zero is my terminal state. And I have a policy mu. And no matter which starting point I pick, I will go around in the state space and then I'll converse to zero eventually, okay? This is the meaning of a proper policy. So if all stationary policies are proper, it implies that I pick a stationary policy, I pick a starting point, and I look at the Markov chain, the corresponding Markov chain, and how it evolves over a period of time, and eventually I'm guaranteed to converse to the terminal state because my uh, stationary policies are proper. This is the assumption in the stochastic shortest path problem. So in the case of average cost problem, this particular structure is slightly modified. And the reason for it will be clear in the next class. And in the average cost, You have the state space S. You divide the state space into two regions. So this is the recurrent, recurrent states. And this is the transient state. Okay, so if, if I'm going from here to my home, the transient state is my, the roads on which I'm traveling, those are transient states. Once I get to my home, I'll just stay inside my home, okay? So I'll do a random walk inside my home, but I won't go outside my home, particularly because it's too cold outside. Um, so in the average cost case, it's known as unichain condition. Unichain condition, what that implies is I pick an initial state, I pick a stationary policy, and I go through a series of transient steps, and then I enter the recurrent state, and then I stay within the recurrent region, okay? I don't come out of it. This is known as unichain condition. The idea is, 
for every stationary policy there exists a single recurrent class and possibly empty empty set of transient states yeah why are you why is it being called a recurrent class and not just some set of recurrent states oh that's the same meaning that's the markov chain terminology so a set of recurrent states is known as a recurrent class so once you enter that class you don't go out of it okay so but the other important thing is a single okay so single recurrent class so in this case i have one recurrent class you could have situations where this is transient this is recurrent class 1 this is recurrent class 2 and you start from an initial condition you go to recurrent class 2 and then you never visit recurrent class 1 and you start from some other initial condition you could go to recurrent class 1 but never visit recurrent class 2 so you don't want to have two recurrent classes you want to have a single recurrent class uh under a stationary policy okay so this one is known as multi class uh average cost mdp um you could have an economy where you start with some initial wealth and then you end up being either rich or poor okay so that particular economy will have two recurrent classes um in another economy no matter what initial state you pick you will eventually converge to a medium class uh household and that's a single recurrent class uh, economy now of course some of these ideas are useful so multi class ideas are useful in uh, some of the queuing theory problems as well as uh, transportation queuing and what else and inventory inventory management so there you see some of these uh, multi class problems but by far the beautiful theory has been developed for uni chain problem some amount of theory is available for multi class but the arguments are much more complex and uh, uh proofs are very detailed whereas uni chain everything is very straightforward and clean so we'll talk about the uni chain uh, average cost problem under the uni chain assumption and show that this relative value iteration operator this composite operator has a certain contraction property with respect to span semi norm so we'll see that in the next class thank you